The topic that I'll be addressing is what can history do to our children? What can history do to our children? Most of you might be aware of my name. Can anybody tell my name? Umar Sharif. Actually, my parents did not give me the name Umar. I have tagged the name Umar to myself. And that's the impact of learning history. My parents gave the name Muhammad Akbar Sharif. But when I started to read the life biography or the life of the great personality Umar bin Al-Khattab I just thought I should have this name for myself. To remind myself that if at all I imitate even 1% of that great personality, it will take me very far. So, excuse me. This is what we have learned from the Sunnah, isn't it? Don't lose your patience. Don't lose your cool. Or else you'll be like, what happened, you know? So anyways, I'll continue uh, with the talk. I started to tag on the name Umar because I was fascinated by this great person. Uh, that's the impact of history on a person. On a, level, level. on a personal level, I can say. You know, children have this habit of imitating. I think most of you who have children at home, you know very well. If at all, the children happen to see the parents praying in the musalla, they will also imitate. They will do the ruku and they will do the sajda automatically. You don't have to train them, you don't have to tell them anything, you don't have to take a workshop or anything of that kind. If the parents are doing something at home, the children have the tendency to, the tendency to just imitate. And at the same time, if the parents have the habit of telling lies, or if they are not, you know, having the sense of rahma or merciful nature, you'll find the children also imitating the parents. So that's so easy. The parents really impact a lot to the children. The Prophet touched on this aspect in one of the hadiths. He said, Kullu mawludin yuladu ala fitra. Every child is born in its fitra, in its natural inclination to worship Allah. It has got the natural tendency, the innate behavior to be good and righteous. But it is the parents who make him a Christian or a Jew. That's what the hadith says. So if you were to leave a child just in the wilderness and you just let him to explore the world and try to discover the secrets of the world and to relate himself with God, at some point in time he will conclude that there is only one God. And if you were to leave him in the wilderness, he would come to a conclusion that there is just one God unless and until his faith is being tampered by his elders. There is a dua I want to recite Surah Nu, chapter number 26 verses sorry chapter number 71 verses 26 and 27 Wala yalidu illa fajiran kaffara this is the ayat of the Quran Nu is making this dua saying that O oh Allah my Lord do not leave upon the earth from among the disbelievers any single person Nuh is making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that you destroy every single inhabitant on earth among the disbelievers. Why? Wala yalidu illa fajiran kafara. It's a very important aspect with that which I want to express. The reason is explained here in the next ayah. Indeed, if you leave them, they will mislead your servants and not begin to accept Wicked one and confirmed disbeliever. The ayat is concluding. If you leave these people as it is, 
all those they are going to picket, they're going to be disbelievers and they're going to be picket people. So how much of impact the parents can have on the children? To the extent that rural lesson is said to destroy all of them. So parents play a very important role. Parents play the role of a role model whom the children imitate without questioning. So why am I trying to touch? Parents, father, mother. Similarly, the same kind of feeling one would have for the forefathers, your great grandfathers, your ancestors. You would want to imitate your ancestors. You would want to be like your ancestors. Let me give an example. This is in Sayyid Bukhari, in book number one and hadith number seven. Heraclius, who is called as Hercules, a king of Rome, he happened to know about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu So he wanted to know who is this man, and he has many questions. He asked many questions. Out of that one question, which was posed to Abu Sufyan, radiallahu anhu, was that was his ancestors kings? You all remember this hadith? The question posed to Abu Sufyan in relation to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu was that was his ancestors kings? Then he says no, his ancestors were not, uh, were not kings. Then later on he explains why he said so. He said if at all his ancestors were kings, he would have wanted to you know, lead this country or lead this state. He, he also wanted to take the position of a ruler. I thought that was the reason. But since you say that his ancestors were not kings, so I can conclude that he must be a true prophet. So today, when you come across the history of Indian civilization, where does Muslim history start in the Indian civilization? Can anybody tell me? Babar, who said this answer? That's a wrong answer. From where does the Muslim civilization start after Prophet Muhammad so in India? Kerala, Kerala, yes, that's the right answer. Which year? 628, according to some reports, 629 CE, according to other reports. You see, when we are given information about Muslim ruling in India, you know how they start? The Muslims came to India invading. What do they say? The Muslims came to India invading. So, this is the perception that is built. And Battle of Panipat was in 1526. We are talking about 629 CE. Can you imagine how much of history is being hidden? Okay, when you were to, you know, give the history, when you were given the history, who conquered India first? From among the Umayya Khalifa, there was a ruler, commander in chief, who came to India. Who is it? Muhammad bin Qasim. Which year was that? Not sure. 8th century. Around 770s, 771, that was the time. Richard Eaton, in his book, Islam and the Indian History, he says the Muslims are here from the 8th century. Then in the 10th century, you have others coming here. Mahmoud al Ghazni, 10th century, he is here. Then after the Buhut, who came in the 12th century? The Ghoris, Sher Khan Suris. Tughlaq, the Khilji dynasty, the Bahmani, how many of you remember this history? Then comes Mughal, the Mughals came when? After that, 1526, 1524, and then after up to Bahadur Shah, until then, we had the Mughal dynasty. So when you come to know that our leaders, our ancestors were the rulers of this land, what do you feel like doing? I was talking about imitation. We all like to imitate, isn't it? Child wants to imitate. And what was the question posed by Heraclius? What was his forefathers doing? Were they kings? If they were kings, then he would want to take that position to rule this land. So now your ancestors of this country were rulers. What do you want to do? Do you have any feeling? Do you want to be like kings or do you want to feel like slaves? What do you have in you? Come on, I want a very, very simple answer, genuine answer. Do you want to be slaves or do you want to be part of the system? 
but you want a part of this country to say that this land belongs to us. Yes. yes. We were ruling this country. Yes. And we are part of this country. We are part of this civilization. As much as Indians we are, we are so much of Muslims. We love the Indian culture. We don't hate the Indian culture. We are not against the Hindus. We are not against the Christians. Somebody told me, what do you have to say about the Muslims who came to India invading? I said, if you say the Muslims invaded India, what did Aryans do? No Aryan civilization? The Indus Valley civilization, after that the Aryan civilization, they came to India, the Brahmins of today. Then there were the Aryans who came to India and they pushed the Dravidians to the south and they occupied to the north. This is a history. The Indian uh, government books are, is teaching these things. The Aryans came. The, what about the Biblicists? The people who are thumping the Bible. The people who teach the Bible. When did they come to India? When they came from outside. What about the Jains, the Mauryans? They also came from outside. So now what the problem with the Muslim psych is that you have a feeling that you are either not belonging to this country, to this land, or you came by oppressing others and taking away others' rights. This is the perception which is built in our psych today. How can you rule this out? Through knowledge, through history. Much of history is being hidden today. You agree? And much of unwanted history is being taught to the children today. Now what we need to do is not debate over unwanted history. We accept there are negativity amongst the rulers from the Muslim community. We accept. We can't take many of the rulers, whatever they did, to be right. Though you may be you know, feeling good about Taj Mahal. Taj Mahal. It's a mausoleum. It's a it's just a construction tomb over the dead man's or dead woman's grave. Mumtaz, she was buried, isn't it? How much of money has been invested on that? How much of labor has been invested on that? Instead, if you had started universities and some sort of civic administrative system, it would have been great, isn't it? We feel proud in saying that, you know, Taj Mahal, Taj Mahal, we built it. What does it serve? It doesn't serve anything great. Somebody who's dead and you want to give air condition into that grave, how much would it help? So the real perspective of understanding how you can empower the community is by teaching our children what history is, the real history. If you are not sharing the true history, then there are people to share the false history. What is the false history? Babur demolished the temple and then he constructed the masjid. This is the false history which is given. I want to know how many of you can counter this. Let me see. You all are, mashallah, educationists. I don't doubt your credibility. I know you are all qualified. But I want to know, as a single person, if you are countered this question, and you happen to be encircled amidst the non-Muslims who are providing some other quotations, some books, reference, and all that, what answer do you have got? I want to know that. Just one or two, just one or two. Simple, logical answer. Yeah. Is Babar only the person who demolished the temples? So this is the logical answer. But you know what it could do? It would mean that Babar actually demolished the temple. We are accepting, though you are giving a refutation, but this refutation would not help. Would it help? It would not. You are accepting. Anybody else? Answer. What? I think uh, <coughs> Guru Nanak was contemporary. Guru Nanak was contemporary? Of, uh, okay. So, probably if he had demolished that, he would have come to know that he would have written in his books. Okay. So, he has not yeah. written. Guru Nanak has not written. That's what you're saying. But I need to check about Guru Nanak. And Guru Nanak, I think Guru Nanak lived much before that. Guru Nanak lived much before that. Anyhow. Uh, Tulsi Das who wrote Ram Charita Manas, Tulsi Das, he lived at the time of Akbar. And Akbar was surrounded with non-Muslims. And Akbar's period is called as the Golden Era in the Indian history books. What is it called as? Golden Era. And under this time he had Raja Todarman, he had Birbal, Jodha, 
and all the people around him, they loved Akbar because he mixed the religion to the extent he formed Dini Nabi. It was a concocted way of presenting a religion because he just mixed everything and said that this is a religion that has to be accepted. So Dini Nabi was made an official religion and it was promoted. He went to that extent. And Tulsidas who lived in that time, he writes Ram Charita Manas and he never mentioned the demolition of a temple. Had it been so, they could have gone and asked Akbar, Oh Akbar, you are so nice, so nice, so sweet to us. You have even compromised the religion so much. You have married some of the non-Muslim women among the Hindus. You have the people to assist you amongst Kodarman and Akbar. Sorry, Birbar. You understand? So they would have gone and taken whatever they wanted and the books of history would have mentioned it. Until the 19th century, around the 1800s, nowhere you find the references to a demolition of a temple. So these are the references. But if you don't prepare yourself with the historical references, you know what will happen? Tomorrow the media is going to term you as an outsider. And we don't give the right answer in the form of literature. And if we don't have the spokesperson to speak the right things, then you will be branded. Today that is what is happening. Today that is what is happening. We are always defensive without proofs. If we are going to teach history in the right perspective, then our children would be able to live here with honor, primarily. And second thing, we would start imitating the best ummah. How much minutes? How many minutes I have? Two more minutes, yeah. We would start imitating the best of the ummah. Today, what are we teaching to the children? History. Three years old boy, he is watching television. He is watching Spider-Man, Superman, and uh, he watches Jackie Chan. Why is he watching all of these programs? Huh? Oh, we do not give an alternative. Can we make cartoons? Huh? I want an answer on my, uh, you know, faculty, uh, my fraternity. I have to discuss with you, isn't it? I want to know, is making cartoons halal, haram, jayas, muba? What do you have to say? Jayas. Jayas. What do you Psychologically. No, no, you can't. Yeah, that's good. Anything else? Psychologically, the experts say that cartoons are not good for the children. Yeah. But why are our, our children watching cartoons at the end of the day? So we are saying no, haram hai, ye nahi karna chahiye. we say all that. But are we keeping our children away from the cartoons? 90% no. Only in those houses where they don't have television, there is no cartoon. But otherwise, 90% no. Either you have some uh, Disney channel, then you have, uh, what is this? So, so many channels, I don't know, okay. They go to the neighbor's house and watch. So let me quote something. We don't have alternatives here. We don't have. You know what they are doing? They are showing Ganesha's story in the form of cartoon. They are showing Rama and they are showing Vishnu and all of them in the form of cartoon. And we don't have these kind of cartoons which are going to captivate the audience. If you are watching some of these cartoons, you know like Harry Potter and all these things, you know, in the form of cartoons, what happens to the children? They start believing in the mythological stories and fictions. And what happens is thereby they are going to disconnect from the history. What in the contrary? On the contrary, what we are supposed to do, we are supposed to prepare alternatives. As much as we are worried about starting Islamic schools, we must be thinking on other lines. Your education does not end from 8 o'clock to 3 o'clock. After that also there is a form of education. Today education is the form of mobile phones through the mobile phones, through the internet. People are learning so many things. They are adopting so many values. Isn't it education? Actually, there's so much to discuss about this aspect of history. There's so much that we can connect with. Uh, probably needs about uh, half a day of workshop or something just on history. How do we inculcate our next generation with the right history? And how do we make them enjoy the sessions on history? So it shouldn't be monotonous and it should not be boring. As today in the morning we were discussing about boring, the word boring. And children are so much, you know, aware of these things. What is more entertaining and what is boring. We must make it very interesting. And we have to provide alternatives. And there are enough fatawa 
I can quote Sheikh Saleh al Munajid, IslamQA.com, and all of other fatawa, where for the children, the cartoons can be made so that you can teach some Islamic values. So, with this, I end my talk. Thank you. Anyone has any comment? Anyone wants to say something? Yeah, yeah. check, check. Yeah. Where? Speak loud. History. Uh, yeah, from the cartoon perspective, yeah. uh, some alternative, the 99 created by Ali Mutawa, mm -hmm. uh, you know, connected with the 99 names of Allah and created some Right, right. Look, I tell you what, the entertainment industry works on a different level altogether. Every second there has to be a variation. It can't be a very mild one. Let's say, say a person who's reached the age of 40, 50 years, he can watch the, you know, the waves hitting the beach shore. You know, you can just watch so relaxedly. But the children today, they need variations. The way the production has to be done has to be really entertaining. I've seen a lot of programs. With all due respect, they have done wonderful effort, but it's not matching the real industry. You understand? So it doesn't make its presence one thing. I want to take an opportunity of mentioning what happened in 1992. 1992, what happens uh, when I say when I say 1992, what comes to your mind? 1992. Uh, but something else also happened. I heard from them. Have you heard of uh, Leopold Weiss? Huh? No. Have you heard of Muhammad Asad? We are educationists. I'm sorry to say that. You know, when I read this book, Islam at the Crossroads, written by Muhammad Asad Rahimahullah, he died in 1992. It's a very important personality. He was born in a Jewish family. Read this book, Islam at the Crossroads. Amazing book, you'll enjoy it. And one of the other famous book is Road to Mecca, Road to Makkah. Wonderful book. He was born in Austria and he died as a Pakistani. He was not given asylum anywhere but in Pakistan. He became a scholar. He translated the Quran into English language. That was Muhammad Hassan. He, in his book, Islam at the Crossroads, he says, the Muslims are so disconnected from their history. And the first of the things that the West did was disconnecting them from the history. This is what they did, and that's what they do, and that's what they want to do now. Right now, is Islamic schools are in the focus, you see. What are you doing? What are you teaching? Sira, Rasulullah Rashidin. Why? We don't have in, in our curriculum. You see, you happen to see the uh, Islamic content in uh, any of the historical books. On Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how many pages will come across? Four pages. And that, and how is it being introduced? Militant religion. That is how it was printed. Militant religion. That's how it's been introduced. Not as Rahmatulil Alamin. They are hiding the facts. And how they disconnect is that not letting you to study the history. That's all. We don't have to teach much of Aqidah, theology, and all of these things. Just teach Sira. The whole thing is turned upside down or downside up, however you want to put it across. History is a very, very powerful subject. I just want to put on a few you know, points so that you go back and do the study. Cheng Ho? Who is Cheng Ho? What was the other name of Cheng Ho? Look, it feels no. I haven't done my study on history, about my own history. Who is Chengo? Zengi. Who is Zengi? Zengi was the person who came to India even before Vasco da Gama came in. And he ruled the portions of Calicut. Kerala here. Kolikot. Under the time of uh, Samudra Raja. That was the time. Zengi was controlling some portions of India. And he was a Muslim voyager and a commander under the Ming dynasty of China. This is our history. He was more powerful than Vasco da Gama and Columbus put together. Can you imagine? This is the history. Have you ever come across in the books of Indian school syllabus? No. So they are hiding. So we don't know our history. But if we start studying our history, you know what will happen to our children? You don't have to tell them, be this, be that. 
they will start imitating just like how I change my name, you will find the whole thing coming back. That's what Imam Malik Raimullah said. If anything has to change, the people of the coming generations, it's only when they go back to what changed them earlier. What the things that changed the earlier generations, if they start implementing on that, the next generations will change. So thanks, thanks for your time. <coughs>